Before we begin, I would like to offer a prayer up to the Lord, so let's lift our hearts up to God. Father, we ask for your mercy and your grace. I'd like to welcome you once again to Faith Reformed Baptist Church, and we are continuing in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 8, and tonight, well, in particular, we're going to look at verse number 26. I'd like to read that verse to you now. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, I have a lot to say about other verses surrounding this verse because it cannot be taken all by itself. It must be taught in its context. It must be understood in its context. And I have heard my whole life many people talk about this verse, especially from the arena of, of doctrinal thought that has to do with uh, the idea of speaking in tongues or having some type of spiritual knowledge that God gives us, and then there is an utterance that cannot be understood, or the spirit groaning in such a way within us that it is some type of charismatic experience in which there is some type of special knowledge given. And I'd like to say, you know, before we even begin, uh, this has really nothing to do with that at all. It, it doesn't even address the issue. That is a non-topic. A non and so with that in mind, I, I would like to go in, into exactly what it does say. And when I read this verse, I remember how we taught about hope, just almost in passing. And there is something that we need to go back and kind of pull that into the context of this teaching today. Because when we read this, we, we read these words, likewise the Spirit also. And when I saw that word also, I'd say, well, it seems to me like the Spirit is doing something that something else does too. Just something else also. In other words, there is an infirmity that we have been teaching about. And there is something that helps that infirmity. But the Spirit also helps our infirmity. And so that's where, I'm, where, where we're going to go to tonight. So what else helps? And, and well, for one thing, what is our infirmity? I think we've been looking at very chiefly the idea that our bodies are going to be changed. We've seen how uh, we all look, are looking forward to the redemption of our bodies. In other words, our bodies will be changed. One day, Paul describes it in one word, we will be glorified. Glorified. And that's going to be the changing, not only of our bodies, but also of the whole creation. And so when God comes back, and there is a new heaven and a new earth, those who have died in Christ shall be raised, and those who are alive shall be caught up in the air, and we shall come back. God will recreate this whole world. There will be a judgment, of course, but when it's all done, we're going to have new bodies worthy of the soul that has been saved by the blood of Christ, and there'll be a new heaven and new earth. There'll be no more groaning of the creation saying, I am under the weight of sin. Things are dying. Things are corrupting. Things are rusting. We are diseased in our bodies. We are getting older, in our, and we forget more things than we remember, and our, everything about us is just, is just a, a very good remember, or something that reminds us all the time, a constant remembrance that we are in this body of corruption, and we labor under this infirmity. However, we have something that has been given to us that Paul is describing as hope. We have a hope. We have a hope of the promises of God. And there is a little bit of a difference when this word is used because I want you to take a look in verse number 24. It says, for we are saved by hope. Now, how many times have we preached the scriptures, for we are saved by faith? And then we come to other scriptures, we are saved by the grace of God. And we are saved by the blood of Christ. Now, it depends on the context of what's being said. Of course, when we are looking at the contrast of whether we should offer our merits up to God, the, the scriptures are going to tell us we are saved by faith, 
not by the works of the flesh. Now, when someone also says, it's what I can do. If I can do this, well, then God will be pleased. We are saved by grace. It is by his kindness that's given to us without our earning it. And what actually does justify us? The blood of Christ because he died for us, imputing his righteousness to us. Now, here we have a phrase, we're saved by hope. Now, I want you to think about the context. Paul is telling us about how the flesh is going to be with us until it's changed. And we're going to be laboring, enduring, and having to put up with it. And I can remember one preacher saying that <clears throat> it's like being chained to a jackal. You just can't get rid of it. It's always there. You wake up with it, you go to bed with it, you know, and you, you eat with it, and everything about it. It's, it's always there. But this constant infirmity that we have is being helped by a myriad of promises. Now, we are saved by these promises in that they give us hope and patience, the type of endurance, the way we can live our lives knowing that our God is in charge and our God is here. And it's a little bit different than being told you have been justified by the work of Christ because that's something that we believe has happened right now and we rest in that. However, there are other promises that have not happened yet. Every time I look at my body, I say, that's still there. Every time I feel the pain, every time I get sick, every time I lose a loved one, every time these things happen to us, we must rest upon a promise that God is going to perform something that's going to happen in the future, something that we can rest upon, something that we can say, I can endure this because I know the Almighty is going to bring this about. And it is a hope. And so Paul is describing this type of hope. As a matter of fact, let's just go to the scriptures a little bit. For we read in verse number 20, it says, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Therefore, I look at it like this. We, having to bear the vanity of this life, we also can bear it with a great assurance. Why? Why can we bear it? Because we have promises. We have been promised by someone who does not lie, who cannot lie. And when he says he will do something, he cannot fail. He cannot fail. And so when we think of the people of the past, like Abraham, he was considering the promises of God. And all the ones that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, they rested in the promises of God. And the promise of the Holy Spirit as spoken of many times in the book of Acts and concerning the promise that is to come and how the Holy Spirit himself can be given and that his presence can also enable us to endure the infirmities of this present evil world and the corrupt flesh that we have with us now, the body of corruption. So, in an overview, the idea that we must have this flesh until the Lord comes back, we have two things that are promised in this passage. There are other things that are promised. We have more than these two things. But what's promised right here in this passage is hope. And we have in verse number 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit, and I'm going to say himself, even though it is correctly translated itself. It's just that there is no other way of saying it. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, he helps us with our prayers. He helps us with our prayers. We'll spend more time on what that means. So, hope and prayer. That's what we're going to look at. So, we are saved by hope. What is the nature of this hope? Like I said before, the very idea of hope concentrates on the idea of what we do not have right now. We do have the atonement. We do have the blood of Christ. 
We rest in that. But there are things that we do not have. There's a lot of things in this world that we have to look at and we have to shake our head. All the miseries, all the diseases, all the pain, all the injustices. What do we look forward to? That day of reckoning when justice shall come. God has promised us that there is going to be justice. God has promised us that there will be a time when the lion and the lamb shall not be at odds. That in the new creation there will be complete restoration of the paradise that was lost. That's not here now. But we have the peace of that. We have the peace of knowing that it's going to happen. It will happen. It is a promise. And therefore, that is part of the assurance. That is part of the endurance. The part of us that we can say, I can do this. I can do this. Do you ever sit in the dentist chair? Have that little needle go in and have all the drills and all the pain. You know what I do? I sit there and I say, this is only 20 minutes. That's what I tell myself. This is only 20 minutes. Even if it's painful, it's not going to be the rest of my life. I'm going to get out of this chair and it will go away and it will be better than what it was when I went in. Sometimes I had this one tooth, whew, boy was it sore, so sore. And the dentist went in, oh, she's going to find out which one it is. I told her which one it was, but, you know, you don't want to pull the wrong one, you know. And so she goes, tap, tap, tap. And, I, and it was so painful that the tears came out, and she apologized for the next 20 minutes. And she went to her assistant. She was the dentist. She said, that's called a hot tooth. <laughs> she was teaching. That was a teaching opportunity for her. But I want you to know that no matter what we endure in this life, it is going to be nothing in comparison, and therefore the knowledge, having the promises, they're like treasures, treasures that we keep, that when we need to look at them, we can pull them out and say, one day this will be different, one day this will be changed, one day it will all be new, and I can have you know, a, a time of relief. One, and it's only a little bit. It's only, you know, that one little time, you know, zzz, you know, <laughs> it only lasts a while. Even, uh, you know, and a lot of times I've had those dentists that seem to, they think just squirting that Novocaine around is going to do it. And, and a boy I've had where I, I just came right out of the chair. But you know what? It's in the past. <laughs> I don't have to worry about it anymore. I can tell you about some of the horrible dentists I've had. But, but dentistry, sometimes I think life in the flesh is just one big dentist chair. <laughs> It is just one big dentist appointment, but it's not going to last forever, folks. There will come a time when our Lord will come back, and it's all going to be made right. Now, hope is resting in what God says he will do. That's the hope we have. And we are saved by that hope by what way? That means that we are going to be helped because of the infirmity that we live under. We live under that, but how can we endure that? Promises. We are saved from the weight, from the heaviness, and from the, the mere, you know, the things that crush other people and cause them to despair. We can endure what they cannot because we have a promise that cannot be broken by someone who cannot fail. And it doesn't matter what it appears like. It doesn't matter if it looks like, I wonder how the hero is going to get out of this situation. The hero is God, and he is going to come out victorious, and it's going to be glorious. It's going to be glorious. Uh, I, I have to confess, I'll probably embarrass my son a little bit, but he, he, he likes to talk to me about stories a lot. He loves stories. I like stories. And I told him one time, and... And uh, I said, the best way to make a good story, this is my opinion of how to write a good story, yeah, the, w the meaner and the uglier and the worse the villain, that, you know, you've got to have a good villain to have a good hero. And you know what? This whole world, if you look at this world, our God is a great God. Our God is a great God based upon what I can see in this world. This world really stinks. This world has a lot of problems, deep-seated problems that have layer upon layers and principalities upon principalities and, and things that we can't even figure out. It is so rotten. 
so steeped in sin, and it is nothing to our God. And when I say nothing, that means that it's not going to defeat him. I remember the scriptures that says that the nations are like the dust on the scales. Now, if you don't know what that means, it doesn't mean that it's dirty and that he just hasn't washed them. It just means that when he goes to calibrate the scales, you know what that means? Make them balanced, and you want to make sure that they're just, and so you, want to, you look at the scale and you, you make sure they're adjusted, right? And if a little bit of dust gets on it, you think it's going to tip it? No, it's not. The little bit of dust is not going to make the scale go boom, like this, no. All the nations of the world are like that dust to God. It doesn't make any difference to him how it, it looks difficult to us. It is nothing to him. It's easy as pie to him. And I'm sorry, I never could understand that phrase. Pie is really hard to make. <laughs> A good pie is. But for some reason, we say it all the time. It's as easy as pie. It is easy. easy it's easy as eating pie, I guess. <laughs> But the idea that we're looking at here is that we have promises that we can depend upon, promises that help us endure. Now, it says that these things are not seen. We don't see them. That's why it's part of the hope. You see, so let's read these scriptures. It says in verse number 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? So he's just kind of helping us understand what he's trying to tell us. It is not exactly like faith. It's something that hasn't been done yet. If he's done it, then you can hold it in your hand and say, here it is. Or it's something that's been completed. We can read it and say, it's been done. Why would we hope for it? This is a, not a hope, so I hope it happens type of thing. No, this is something that has not been given yet, but will happen for sure. Now, I mentioned in the past, just briefly, how some people believe that they're not allowed to really believe that they're saved. They can only hope that they're saved because they believe it's more humble to say, I hope I'm going to be saved. That's not what Paul is saying here at all. It is glorifying to God to know that the salvation done by our Christ is worthy enough to redeem us from all sin and the promises that he makes, which we don't see right now, will surely happen. That's why we have the enduring and staying power. Why does he yet hope for it if he has it in his hand? That's what Paul is saying. And so we have promises. And so the examples that Paul gave in this passage, in, this, in these verses that we're looking at, two main promises or two main examples of things that we can see that we don't have them. And really, we don't see them. In other words, the whole creation is going to be changed. It travails in pain. It, it groans under the weight of its own sin. And us ourselves, the bodies, the body of, of corruption that we have, those are the two things that he says, you see these things? They're not glorified. We don't see our glorified bodies. We don't see the new heaven and new earth. We, only those who have been born again can see it with the eye of faith. That's all. But they are not changed yet. One day they will be. They will be as sure as God is God and God is on his throne. They will be changed. So we are saved by hope. Now, <clears throat> this portion of scripture deals with something called the bondage of corruption. I want to make sure you understand what that infirmity means, the bondage of corruption. This is something that we will endure until the Lord comes back. There, is, there isn't going to be a place on the earth where we get to go to a, I don't know, a, a holy city amusement park where it's glorified in there, and we get to see, you know, the things that God's going to do. We don't get to try on new bodies or anything like that. There isn't going to be like anything like that on this world. We will endure the infirmity until God comes back. And one day, we know that our bodies will be changed. And Paul calls it glory. He calls it glory. Now, the grace that we can experience is called this hope. All right, and I want you to, when I say the word hope, I want you to think of it like this. Hope is like a treasure chest of promises that you may open up and look and read and caress and love and say, this is beautiful. 
one day we have this. And it's something that gives you strength and endurance. Now, the Spirit also provides help. Hope provides help, but also the Spirit provides help. That's the second part of it. Okay? So, let's take another look at verse number 26. Likewise, just like hope provides help to you, because Paul doesn't use the word infirmity before this passage, but he does talk about the infirmity. He just names it in verse number 26. So, likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Now, why do you think Paul assumes that none of us know what we ought to pray for? I think because Paul understands the sons of Adam. He understands that we are no different than he is and that he is no different than we are. And many times we have this vision of what life should be like. And when I was a little boy, I guess people used to explain it like, I, I want a house with a white picket fence. I don't know why the white picket fence was always there, but, you know, they have this dream that they'll have this uh, beautiful wife with well-behaved children in their own little house with a car, and, uh, you know, all the things that they have, that's their dream come true. Everyone has this vision Okay, and a lot of times women, after a while, they look at their husband and they say, he's not fitting my image, or the wife looks at the husband and say, you know, he's not my dream man anymore, or the car doesn't look like that car they envisioned, and the house and everything else, and pretty soon people become angry and frustrated with what they think life should be. And why am I saying all this? Because Paul is saying, you don't seem to know what you ought to pray for. Because we seem to come to God with this idea of what life should be. And God should be able to make that happen because he is almighty, is he not? He is the almighty God who can give you the desires of your heart. And does not the scripture say, he will give you the desires of your heart. And yet, we have to be told and taught, you just don't pray and ask for the things that you ought. Because before we knew God, we had our list made. Before we knew he even existed or that we were sinners, somehow we already had a formula for happiness and contentment and fulfillment. And just because we found God, we seem to add him on to our dream as some type of energizer or a battery to make it work. Now I can be happy. God can make this work. He's like that flux, you know, flux capacitor that can actually make it work, you know. He can, he can make it happen. But that's not what we're supposed to be praying for. As a matter of fact, we need the Holy Spirit to help us know what we ought to pray for. And many times, the hopes and dreams and aspirations of Christians need to be crushed so that God can show them what they should be looking for, what they should be praying for. Many, many times, we need to learn how to pray, Thy will be done, Thy kingdom come. Many times saying the Lord's Prayer becomes an empty phrase. Thy will be done. It's almost like, I know you're going to do it, so just do it. But we don't seem to understand the idea that you should be wanting His will. Help my will be your will. Not my will, but thy will be done. That's what our Lord prayed. And He was the only begotten Son of God. And as He lived His life in the flesh that he took upon for us. He prayed, Thy will, not mine, be done. But we need to be led of the Spirit. Why? Because if we are not, the infirmity of our flesh and living in this world is going to crush you. You'll never find the joy of the Lord 
If you find your joy in the things of this world, if you find the things of this world more enticing and they are your goals, you need to have the help of the Holy Spirit in this. You need to have the help of the Spirit to guide you and to reveal to you and erase your list and start writing the new list, the list that is in His Word, the list that says, consider me, taste of the Lord and see if He is good and see the beauty of the glory of God. You need to really see that you don't deserve anything. You need to really see that God's glory is worthy of your hoping for. That it is worthy for you to pray that it happens and comes. For people to really pray for justice in this world. They are calling for judgment. And the world does not understand that they're standing underneath of the guillotine and they're saying, I wish that thing would fall once and for all. I wish that there would be justice in this world. But they are the ones that are in the electric chair. They're the ones that are sitting. They only see justice as what will happen or preventing them from getting what they want or punishing the ones that have wronged them. They never see it for themselves. Now I want you to see yourself and how Christ has pardoned you. And when you pray for justice, don't be glad when others who are just like you will be condemned, but warn them as you have been warned. And then still consider the beauty of justice. I'm going to tell you something. This world deserves to go to hell. All of it. All the people in it. You especially. Us. When I say you especially, I'm talking human beings. You just happen to be here. Human beings. Because trees, they're just trees. They have no heart. They have no will. But we are the ones that choose to hate and to disobey and to, to hide in ignorance and in lies and deception because we know that there is a God who is holy and we just don't like it. And we would rather, the human race would rather pretend that there is no God. That's how much they hate justice. And when they, and when they cry for justice, it's only their justice. And so, if we begin to learn the beauty of God, if the Holy Spirit begins to write the word upon our hearts, not just upon the page, then, then we shall be taught how to pray. And the Holy Spirit will help us. It will help us. But there's even more. It says these words, Likewise the Spirit helps our infirmity, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. However, the Spirit himself, I'm going to say himself, makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now I'm going to say this. The, the Holy Spirit does not groan. He is not the one groaning here. And people say, well, no, it says right here that the Spirit it groans. No, 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 no. The groanings that are here is implying that there is no way to express it there is a sign and a groaning and a, uh, there, there is like, this world is so full of sin that I don't even know how to ask. I don't even know what to say. It just grieves me. But it is the Holy Spirit that shows me. By contrast, the more I see the beauty of God, the more I see the sin of the world, and I cannot fathom how deep it is. And it grieves me. It reminds me of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah where Peter said in his second epistle in the second chapter where he says that just Lot, the man who was just in his spirit, was vexed, vexed by the city that he lived in and the sin that was there. It vexed his soul daily. And it just, he didn't know, you know, I, I can identify with that. I can identify that there is a vexing of this whole world. 
against God, and I can't always put my finger on it. And when I think I got it figured out, it's like there's, okay, this is even worse than I thought. And, and if, I did, it, if I pray for something, how do I know if I'm going to make it worse? I mean, if, if God actually gave me everything I prayed for, I think my life would just be horrible. But he knows even better what I need than what I ask for. And so it's safer for me to say, thy will be done, than to say, Lord, let me tell you exactly what I need. Let me start with the A's. And I start listing them out. Oh, Lord, let me not ask amiss. Let me not consume my time with you and my relationship with you with only my own personal lusts. But let me seek your face only and let me understand and trust your will because you will be bringing things into my life that are going to be so uncomfortable. Why? Because we live in a world of sin. Can God use sin? There's nothing else left to use. It's all around us. And therefore, we must endure the infirmity of this world. And we don't even know how to pray. And it grieves and vexes us. But the Holy Spirit teaches us to groan anyhow, to pray anyhow, because we have an intercessor. We have an intercessor that knows what to say. He knows what to offer to God in prayer. He is interceding for us with exactly what needs to be said. He knows what we need, and he stands before his face pleading for us. We don't even know what to ask. And yet, the one who does know pleads for us. And that helps me. It helps me to know, oh, if I'd only known, I'd have prayed for that. Oh, just give your heart to God. Plead, God help us. And when we see the sin, may God's glory be oversha overshadow everything. May his kingdom come. Thy will be done. I don't even know what to ask for half the time. I just know that there's so much wrong. God, prevent the wrong. Stop the wrong. But he's going to do it in his good time, in the way that is best for him. He's worked it all out. There is a plan. It is not an accident. It is not unmonitored. It's not running free reign. It is not a ball of confusion. Everything is in the hands of God. And so when we pray, and I'm telling you, there are two things. There are the written promises, the hope that we have, and the spirit within us that we can ask and we can pray. That's how we can endure. Thy will be done. And we don't even know what to ask for. But it does make us groan, does it not? It does grieve us. It vexes us. But only by leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us to seek his face. It leads us in this direction. This is not some type of Pentecostal groaning where people start to mutter and start to, you know, do all types of things and saying, you know, the Spirit is just speaking a language and he's doing this and that. Look, I don't know how else to say. That's just silliness. Let's find out what the Scripture does say and hold on to that. And we don't need to concentrate on that. I don't need to preach 20 minutes on how bad the Pentecostals are. I don't need to do that. Okay? That's their problem. I'm sure that the Lord will help them if they are honest and seek his face. I know he will. If they're honest and seek his face, the Lord will help them. But I know that the scriptures right now are very clear. They're very clear. We have infirmities that we must live under until God comes back. And when he does, the promises all come or will be met. He will keep his promises. And until then, that's going to be our strength. That's kind of going to be how we endure. That's going to give us patience. Patience to endure. So... Here's my conclusion. While we remain in this present evil world, there's no way you can escape this body of corruption. That's the bad news. <laughs> That's, I don't know what to say. You know, you're not getting out of it, folks. 
You're just not going to get out of it. There's just going to be suffering. There's going to be disappointment. There's going to be something that we, that we have to live by faith. And there will be disappointments. However, the disappointments must always be met with by the promises of God. The promises that He says all these things are going to work out. All these things will work out for the good of those who love me. That's what God is telling us. And I might, you know, I might as well not even preach that passage, right? Because everything I've said to this point leads up to that passage, does it not? For all things work for the good of those who love the God, those who are the called according to his purpose. And therefore, we will, and there's no way to get out from underneath of the fact that we will endure many things in this life. We're going to endure the pain. We're going to endure sickness, decay, sufferings, difficulties. We're going to endure accidents. They look like accidents to us. You know, they do. And you can prevent accidents if you're careful. And you can increase accidents if you're careless. But there are some things that just happen. They just happen. And they're going to happen to you. They're going to happen to everyone, saved and unsaved. And sometimes they look the same. The big difference is, is that the unsaved end up hating God about it. We end up thanking God. Thanking God. Now you say, well, do we have to thank God for all the hardships that we endure? What? You want me to say, you want me to tell you, yes, you do, grit your teeth. You know, grit your teeth and say thank you, even though you don't mean it. No, 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 no. You need to come to the realization that you ought to because you have good reason to. You have good reason to thank God for the evil things. Remember what Job said, shall we not receive evil from his hand and not good? It's just, just good. He's going to give us both. And remember what he said, and he meant it. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. What can we say? The promises of God, they are the treasures that we treasure, that we can take out and say, this is mine. One day, my body won't do this anymore. One day, my life will be his in his presence. And the beauty of holiness will be enjoyed from the very depths of my own heart. And there will be no more confusion, no more deception, no more lies. Nothing like that. It'll all be great. We as Christians are going to also suffer for righteousness sake. You're going to suffer because you do right. And there will be those that will suffer less because they do wrong. Do not envy the wicked in this way, folks. Do not envy them. It is better to suffer for righteousness sake than to escape that suffering by doing wrong. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's better to eat your healthy food now and save your dessert for later. Now, now, I know, you can eat your dessert first if you want, but in life in general, life in general, do the right thing even if it hurts. Do the right things even if you have to suffer for it. There is more beauty and more, it is the way life should be lived. It is what God has for us. He has for us the strength to do right when it's going to hurt you and you can still enjoy it. You can enjoy the pain. You can enjoy the endurance because we have the patience of the saints. We have the patience of the promises of God. The promises that cannot be broken. He who cannot lie and he who cannot fail has promised and they are ours to treasure. And they are our strength. And if we don't know what to ask for, the Spirit can lead us. And believe me, you're going to be vexed in this world. You're going to look at sin and say, I can't figure this out. This is just wrong. This is just wrong. Everything about it is just wrong. I don't even know what to pray for. And so God, please take care of it. Just take care of it. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. We must learn that he leads us to live a life that we did not plan. We must learn to live a life that he planned. 
Do not hate God for changing your plans. He's fixing your plans. If that perfect marriage and that nice little house with the picket fence and the beautiful car doesn't happen, he may keep you from a husband. He may even throw you in a third world country. Who knows what God has planned for you? Who knows what things you may be called to endure? It may be ugly. It may be harsh. But I know one thing. It's better than your plan. It's better than a selfish plan to live a life of sin thinking that you're going to get something that's going to make you, and I'm going to do it, happy. <laughs> I always think, mm, you know, happy. Don't go for happiness. Go for God. You go for God, and there'll be lots of things to suffer, but you'll know the joy that God has for you, the promises. And one day, you'll have a life that is undescribable. I can't describe it, but I feel in my heart and in my soul that it cannot be compared with the things we can give up for it here. There's no comparison to it. We must learn the obedience, trusting and giving up our own selfish ways, our own pathways, our own achievements. We must do greater things, greater things than we planned for ourselves. We must live for the glory of God. We must seek to exalt God and Christ. We must live that he may be exalted. That is the greatest achievement achievement a human heart can achieve. It is the purpose for our created, for being created, to glorify God. And the sinner is going to say, he sounds a little self-absorbed, this God. He wants to be always in the center of attraction. He wants to be lifted up. He's worthy, folks. He's worthy. If you can just wrap your mind around it, he should be. He must be the center of attraction. He should be. We should not. We are being loved by God when he enables us to see he is the worthy center of all things. We deserve hell. You could just wrap that around your head. We truly do. You don't deserve anything but you've been given grace. We need to glorify our God. In doing these things, we're going to learn that we can endure. We can stick it out. And I don't mean like, oh, it's, it's, it's so tough to do. God is not going to place on you that which you cannot endure because God loves you. But if you find your life getting tough, you're going to find that grace is going to be provided to you. He's not going to crush you. He's going to make you into a diamond. He's going to make you into something better than what you are. And if it gets really, really tough, then you can thank God for the grace that's on its way. Because God will not abandon you. He promised it. He will not. If it gets bad, really, really bad, the Lord is there. Our Lord is here. He is our strength. And with patience we can endure. Because our God is for us. That's our hope. And don't forget your prayer. Because God hears our prayers. It's like an incense rising up. And he loves our prayers. And he touches us. The spirit within us teaches us. Enables us to see the hideousness of sin and the beauty of God. And we groan. We groan, oh God, and he hears our sighs and intercedes and gives word to the Father, saying, this is what they grieve for, isn't it worthy? This is what they love, isn't it worthy? Your spirit has taught them. Let's not give them a stone, but give them bread. Give them a fish and not a serpent. We ask and he will give. And do not believe that if God says no, that he doesn't like you. He is giving you something better. He is changing your unworthy plans for his plan. 
for his mighty decree to be completed. God has done all things. He said it was very good. And on his seventh day, he's rested. And you need to enter into that rest. You need to enter into the rest that God has completed it. It's a great rest. Nothing can defeat us. That's one of the promises. One of the things you can take out and say, it's going to be all right. All going to be okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your promises.